And what I understand is I understand the simple math. There are two parties, Republican and Democrat. One don't give a damn. One empowers Stephen Miller, who's stopping the black farmers from getting their money. He's threatening law schools. One appointed three supports, three Supreme Court justices who rule against us in critical cases. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't fight, challenge, push, go hard against Democrats. But if I know evil wants to take my ass out, I ain't trying to coexist with evil. And what I'm not going to do is sit my ass at home and allow the other evil folk to vote and elect people. And then I sit back and bitch and moan and go, I can't believe they did that. I can because they told your dumb ass they were going to do it. Yeah, you know, as much as I loathe and despise Donald Trump, uh, practically everything he did, he told you ahead of time he was going to do it. Your ass was just too stupid to believe him and do the research. He told you he was going to do it. He told you he was going to only nominate Supreme Court justices who would overturn Roe versus Wade. He told you he he told you he was going to nominate uh, federal judges. He told you he was going to unleash the police. He ran on the platform of Blue Lives Matter. OK, so all, all the things that he did, he told you he was going to do ahead of time. But, oh, Lord, I tell you, it's always some stuck on stupid white folks in America. One of them is Ryan Walters. He is the Oklahoma State Superintendent of Schools. This dumbass, and I'm talking about dumbass, actually said this about the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. Tulsa Race Massacre not fall under your definition of CRT. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't address that part. I would never tell a kid that because of your race, because of your color of your skin, or your gender, or anything like that, you are less of a person or, an, or are inherently racist. That doesn't mean you don't judge the actions of individuals. Oh, you can absolutely. They, historically, you should. This was right. This was wrong. They did this for this reason. But to say it was inherent in the, because of their skin is where I say that is critical race theory. You're saying that a race defines a person. I reject that. So I would say you be judgmental of the, of the issue, of the action, of the content, of, of, of the character of the individual. Absolutely. But let's not tie it to the skin color and say that the skin color determines it. One more follow-up. How does the Tulsa race massacre not fall you. under your definition of Samaria? Uh, I, I answered it. That, that's my answer. And again, I, I felt the like... The Tulsa race massacre was a race massacre. I, How does it not I, fall under CRT? I, I've answered your question. I do appreciate it. Very respectful. The 100 years of silence was about race. How does that not fall... How does that not qualify for CRT? I, I appreciate your question. That's how you light his dumb ass up. Demario Solomon Simmons, uh, co-founder of Justice for Greenwood, joins us right now. He represents uh, three of the survivors of the Tulsa 1921 Tulsa race massacre. I mean, this goes to show you, uh, Demario, the extent that this is why also I wrote my book, White Fear. These the white folks like this guy who want to act as if. Yeah, let's discuss the Tulsa race massacre. But let's leave race out of it. And this fool is over all schools in Oklahoma. Yes, sir. Roland, good to see you. I first want to say congratulations to your million, one million subscribers on YouTube. Very proud of you for that. Appreciate it. And Roland, listen, you're right. This guy, is the, he's the steward and the Oklahoma Secretary of Education the superintendent for all schools. And people like Ryan Walters, this is what he said. It's so absurd, ridiculous, it's ahistorical. He's trying to brush aside the facts and the reality of what the massacre was about. Listen, they said their stated goal of the massacre was to run the Negro out of Tulsa. When they bombed and burnt down 40 square blocks, as this picture shows right here, it was for all of the black, the 10 to 12,000 black people that lived in, in Greenwood. After the massacre, listen, look at the postcard. Running the Negro out of Tulsa. I'm not making this up. And 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 then in the in the newspapers days after, then the city city of Tulsa government and the Tulsa County government, they said we want to make sure that we police these Negroes more aggressively so quote unquote nigger town does not rise up again. These are the things that these people said at the particular time. And this is why it's so important to us at Justice for Greenwood that we continue to move forward this work because we have to fight these false 
absurd, ridiculous, false narratives that people like Ryan Walters want to put out into the world. And another reason why we are so hopeful that our case, our current case that's pending right now in the Tulsa County District Court will be allowed to move forward to trial so we can get the truth of what happened with the massacre and we can forever shut down people like Ryan Walters. So this sort of reminds me of the white folks in Virginia uh, who did not want to deal with when, when the law was passed that the governor had to, when, when they kept folks with felony conviction from voting. And the, I mean, like literally the law was passed and the lawmakers said on the floor, this is to keep the darkies from voting. That was the actual intent. And then years later, it's like, whoa, no, 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 no. That's not why we're continuing this. No, the, the record is clear. It was intended to keep the darkies from voting. No different than law in 1890 where they changed the Constitution and they added a whole slew of felony convictions in Mississippi to keep black people from voting. So white, there are white folks in this country who want to deny exactly why laws were created and those same laws are still impacting us today, but they didn't want to say, oh, no, no, no. The intent and the motive has changed. The motive is the same. Well, it's, it's racial gaslighting rolling up at its finest because not only do they want to be able to talk about laws that we know are specifically based upon race or things like the massacre is specifically based upon race, when it's something that's going to help us, then they say, oh, we don't want to do it that way. Think about the 14th Amendment. You know, the Supreme Court just gutted utilizing the 14th Amendment just uh, passed some, some terrible laws last week dealing with uh, college admissions, LGBT rights, et cetera, right? But the 14th Amendment, what is the original intent of the 14th Amendment? It was to help empower black people who were coming out of enslavement. It is a race conscious law, and yet the Supreme Court is saying we cannot use this in a race conscious matter because we don't think that's the way it should be interpreted, even though that's the original intent. So it's racial gaslighting. We deal with it each and every day all across this country and double time here in Oklahoma. The good news is, the good news is of people like Ryan Walters, people like uh, Donald Trump and others who are making it very plain to our people that this is a war that we're in. We're in the war for our freedom, our liberty, and our very lives. And we must organize. That's why I tell everyone that's looking at this right now, work with us at Justice for Greenwood, send us a donation, get on our newsletter, connect with us, and organize to fight against this because the other side is very organized, they're very motivated, and they have a very clear path for where they want to go. When they say make America great again, that means putting us in chains again, that's putting us back on plantations again, and that is taking away all our rights again. You know, and when you talk about fight, uh, you know, fighting the monarch, let's also be clear, these same white folks for nearly 100 years may wanted no mention of the Tulsa Race Massacre in any book in the state of Oklahoma. That also was deliberate by white folks. Deliberate specifically and the continuing harm is because of race base. It's all about racism. It's all about power. They want to continue to subjugate our ability to be free, independent, wealthy, healthy individuals and communities in this nation. And the Tulsa race massacre in Greenwood and Black Wall Street was the greatest example of black wealth, black excellence, black education, black health. And they destroyed that specifically and they wanted to keep that story hidden from the history books because they don't want us to take the, the, our, our lessons and our cues and our inspiration from Greenwood. But the deal is this, Merlin, that Justice for Greenwood and people like you, we're still fighting, we're still organizing, and we're meeting this threat head on. We said to Ryan Walters, I put out a statement today here in Oklahoma, and I'm saying it on your airways. Ryan Walters, we will continue to talk about the massacre. We will continue to fight for reparations for the massacre. We'll continue to fight for truth, justice, and equity for our three living survivors and all of the descendants throughout this entire country. There's nothing that Ryan Walters can say that will stop us from fighting until we get the justice and reparations that we absolutely deserve. And what also is needed we need more white folks like the one who was questioning him doing that, where it's not just black folks having to do all the work. That's true allyship. You know, that white person who showed up, that was a Republican, uh, a Cleveland County Republican meeting. So that meant someone had to go out of their way, 
go to that meeting, which was in a, in a library in Norman, Oklahoma, sit on the front row and specifically say, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you firsthand, right, right on hand. And I'm going to say that's not an easy thing to do here in Oklahoma because Oklahoma is a right wing, deep red Republican MAGA state. So we need those type of allies that will stand forward and be out on the front lines and will provide us the necessary power that they bring just with their white bodies. If a black person was maybe making those same questions at that location in Norman, Oklahoma, the police probably would have been called, no doubt. This is also why, uh, DeMario, why, why we have to show up at events like that. And, and I say this all the time, that elections are the end of one process at the beginning of another. You're there in a red state. Ryan, Wa yep. Ryan Walters has pissed off Republicans for being stupid. Yes. I mean, even they have said, he a dumbass. They stripped right. him of his powers. But this is the kind of stuff where I'm saying we got to show up at, at town halls, at events like that, to challenge these folks, had a camera rolling, and to force them to answer to show how stupid they are. I totally agree, Roland. And we have to have the courage that the black men and women of Greenwood had when they showed up at that courthouse in 1921 when a white power structure wanted to uh, lynch Dick Rowland downtown Tulsa. You had about 100 of the most prominent, wealthiest, most educated black men in the entire country that put everything on the line because they had the courage and the love of Dick Rowland to show up and say, you're not going to do this in our community. And that's what it takes. You have to sacrifice sometimes your time. You got to sacrifice your comfort to go show up and be strong in the face of adversity. That's what the legacy of Greenwood is about. It is not just about the massacre and the destruction, but it is a legacy of power. It's a legacy of education. It's a legacy of wealth. It's a legacy of showing up for one another. And that's what we have to do in this moment as a community throughout this nation. We have to show up for one another. We have to organize together. We have to get money put our money together and fight these people as hard and as fast and as powerful as we possibly can. All right, absolutely. Tomorrow's Solomon Simmons. I appreciate it, brother. Thanks a lot. Roland, always good to see you. Peace, brother. Holla. Kelly, I, I, again, this is, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to get our people to understand that we are in the middle of a war. Not a battle of a war. These people, first of all, we know it's been going on, but the election of Barack Obama really heightened this whole deal. But I still contend it was the death of George Floyd that caused many of these races to go, oh, shit. And it wasn't because of us. They freaked out when they saw young white kids out in the streets protesting. They freaked, freaked out when they saw them uh, inside of offices demanding change as well. So this attack, if you will, this attack on anything black, anything dealing with DEI, anything dealing with race, it absolutely is because they are, it's white fear, they are scared to death of losing power. Because at the end of the day, Roland, I feel like that's all they have. Um, they don't have the numbers. They don't necessarily have the influence. They absolutely do not have logic on their side. All they have is a power that they stole for centuries that they're trying to maintain and keep. And when you have uh, a generation that frankly, in my opinion, is probably the freest generation on record as far as thought, as far as movement, as far as, as culture is concerned. Yeah, you're right. They are scared because it's like, oh, wait, we, we didn't teach this generation how to be as racist as we are. We didn't teach this generation how to be as bigoted. Um, and we kind of can't anymore because the, 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 uh, it's out the bar now. You know, it's out the door. So they are doing everything they can in their power to, you know, rewind the clock a little bit by way of these policies, by way of this rhetoric, um, by way of the superintendent thinking that he can get away with saying that the Tulsa race matter.
massacre wasn't about race. It's like, if you say it enough times, maybe it'll be true. And I feel like that's the logic that they're trying to perpetuate. And it's frankly not going to work as effectively as they think it is because this generation is so smart, is so free, is so cultured outside of your centricity, outside of the whiteness that my generation and generations prior are used to. Um, you know, Matt, um, again, when we, when we start looking at, you know, what, what is happening here, um, a lot of people were blowing off the attacks against critical race theory. But they were very clear. Chris, Christopher Rufo, Rufo made it clear. They were trying to lump anything dealing with race under that banner to stoke white fear. How did Glenn Youngkin win in Virginia? Because white turnout increased. That's how he won. They, what they understand is, to, to Kelly's point, we look at the numbers. If they can stoke white fear, and if they can see, this last election was supposed to be the first time, was supposed to be the first time in American history that the total electorate of white, of, of white voters fell under 70%. In Virginia, it was around 74. In the 2020 election, same thing, was above 70. And so they understand when you start dropping below 70% of the total electorate being white, then you are hitting that, you, you, you're moving towards that nation becoming a majority of people of color. That is what's freaking them out. And so they are trying to find every racial button to push in order to keep that white fear machine going. And every mechanism to, you know, aid that machine. I, I like it, Roland, when you pass it to me and you basically make the arguments I'm going to make. But you're right, 100 percent, particularly with CRT. I mean, we've talked about it a million times on the show, but that has become a dog whistle for anything race. And what's particularly insidious about people like Walters is they try to paint it like they have some moral high ground. If you listen to what he said, what he said is, oh, yeah, I want you to decry the action, but you don't make it applicable to the person because of their race. When well, we all know that Tulsa race riots were about race, as the brother just said. Right. I mean, that's all it was about. But what they try to do is repackage it and try to make it about some individual analysis of an individual person, despite the fact that whiteness is the primogenitor of all of it. It's the thing that's driving everything. So I think you're 100 percent right. And that goes part and parcel with things like uh, voter disenfranchisement and trying to make it harder to vote, right? Because those num it's a numbers game. Anybody who's inv been involved in any political campaign, it's all numbers. It's all where you're going to get the biggest turnout on your boxes, you know, what's the best precinct, all that stuff is all numbers. So it's all metrics and it's all a matter of decreasing the numbers of us participating and increasing relatively the numbers of them participating as the overall number dwindles. So I think you're exactly right in your analysis. This right here, this right here, um, Michael, is why I spend so much tr time trying to explain to black people, don't get caught up in dumb shit. <laughs> don't, don't, don't get caught up, don't get caught up in um, these silly arguments and these silly uh, debates, things along those lines. I mean, I mean, here's a perfect example. And, and, I, and I had to sit here and, and so you take uh, uh, Brianna uh, Joy Gray. She, she tweeted this nonsense earlier. Uh, endorsing Joe Biden now is a betrayal of progressive interest. It was true of Bernie Sanders endorsement and is true of AOC. Most Democrats don't want Biden to run. Bernie and AOC are tragically out of step with the movement and the moment. Well, first of all, most people don't want to run because he's too old, but he's running. So I responded to her uh, and I said, oh, please, that's utter BS. You, you must enjoy losing. The, mo the moment Biden won in 2020, we knew he was running for reelection. This ain't the Sims. It's reality. Bernie Sanders knows it, too. This is the rationale that led to Trump winning and getting three SCOTUS picks. She she then goes, people like Roland Martin will try to guilt and shame you into selling your vote cheap. The corporate Democratic Party cannot exist without your cooperation. It's your right to stop cooperating, demand more. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I, I, I couldn't uh, leave it there. So I had to respond uh, to that foolishness. 
Uh, and I said, nah, Brianna, I'm not stuck on stupid. I'm in Virginia. I saw white turn on increase to let Yunkin. I saw what happened when CRT was bullshit and used to drive white fear. You have taken L's in elections because you desire the perfect. I understand power. Losers have none. The thing that we have to understand that we have to keep saying to black people, Michael, all across this country, and I don't care whether your ass call yourself a Freeman, FBA, B1, ADOS, whatever the hell, the folk on the other side don't give a damn what letter you use. You can holler Freeman, FBA, B1, ADOS, uh, you can call yourself whatever the hell, All the, their whole deal is to keep your ass in your place. And what I understand is, I understand the simple math. There are two parties, Republican and Democrat. One don't give a damn. One empowers Stephen Miller, who's stopping the black farmers from getting their money. He's threatening law schools. One appointed three supports, three Supreme Court justices who rule against us in critical cases. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't fight, challenge, push, go hard against Democrats. But if I know evil wants to take my ass out, I ain't trying to coexist with evil. And what I'm not going to do is sit my ass at home and allow the other evil folk to vote and elect people. And then I sit back and bitch and moan and go, I can't believe they did that. I can because they told your dumb ass they were going to do it. Yeah, you know, as much as I loathe and despise Donald Trump, uh, practically everything he did, he told you ahead of time he was going to do it. Your ass was just too stupid to believe him and do the research. He told you he was going to do it. He told you he was going to only nominate Supreme Court justices who would overturn Roe versus Wade. He told you he he told you he was going to nominate uh, federal judges. He told you he was going to unleash the police. He ran on the platform of Blue Lives Matter. OK, so all, all the things that he did, he told you he was going to do ahead of time. But people like that. See, see, now th this is one of the problems with the 2016 presidential election. You had a lot of these woke ass progressives out here. People like uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Dr. Eddie Glaude on, uh, on MSNBC, who sat his ass on MSNBC and told people, don't vote for president. In 2016, he said, vote for everything except president. My what TV one show said it, and I was like, president. nah, bro, I ain't feeling that. Yeah. So, so, but then he, but, but then he found out fat meat is greasy. I don't know why they still have him on, uh, 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 MSNBC. He, now, now on, on Deadline White House, on Nicole Wallace's show, he said he apologized, you know, for saying that. Uh, this was maybe a year or two ago. He said he had too much faith in white people. Wait a second. You got a PhD and you're you that ignorant not to see this, not to see this domestic terrorist threat coming named Donald Trump, who ran on the platform of law and order, which was a throwback to Richard Nixon in 1968, who ran on the platform of law and order, which means protect white people and lock up African-Americans. But the person that you tweeted with, I don't go back and forth with people like this. This is what I do. I drop this on a proper documentation ends all conversation. Read fact sheet. The Biden-Harris administration and advances equity and opportunity for black Americans and communities across the country. That's at whitehouse.gov. It's about 36 pages. It breaks down how the policies of the Biden-Harris administration are helping and benefiting the African-American community. Now, you compare that to what Republicans are doing. You compare that to what independents are proposing. This is stuff that's actually happening or they are working on. So we have to understand you, you're not going to find perfect candidates just like you don't have perfect constituents. And this is one of the problems with a lot of these people who are so idealistic don't understand history, never read the U.S. Constitution, and sit up here, if they can't find somebody that's perfect, then they're not going to vote. The, one of the most important things I learned from the 2016 presidential election is how much BS white people will take to achieve their goal. For many people who voted for Trump, he wasn't their first, second, third, fourth, or fifth candidate. OK, he wasn't their first, second, third, fourth or fifth choice. But they said this is about the Supreme Court. They said this is about controlling the federal bench. They said this is about overturn, overturning Roe versus Wade. They saw him as a means to an end. OK, they were willing to hold their nose and use him as a tool to accomplish what they wanted. We have to do the same thing. I'm neither Democrat nor Republican, but I sure as hell ain't stupid. We need to understand how to use politicians and the Democratic Party as a tool to accomplish what we want. And that has to be by mastering history, economics, law and politics. Well, and Michael, I know you want to talk about your class. I also uh, want to have you on my radio show Sunday to talk about it also. But do you have a couple seconds on that? Oh, I'll come on your show. All right, everybody, this Saturday. July 1st, 2023, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Join me for my new 12-week online course, Ancient Kemet, The 
the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, visit my website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Register there. We deal with thousands of years of history and mm -hmm. what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. It's a very visual presentation. You will never see history the same way again. All right. Thank, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. You got to understand what you got to go back and look what happened after the Civil War ends and look at 1868 when Florida writes their state constitution and they uh, um, write into the state constitution felony disenfranchisement laws. OK, this start, we see this starting in, in, in Florida. So if you were convicted of a felony mm -hmm. in 1868, you would lose your right to vote for life. They, they were targeting African-Americans. African-Americans were 48 percent of a population in the state of Florida in 1868 as a result of slavery. Florida is a former Confederate state. OK, mm -hmm. they took up arms, committed treason against the U.S. government based upon Article 3, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. And after slavery ended, they wanted to, to, to arrest African-American political power. They said they did this to prevent a Negro legislature. So they expanded the number of crimes that were classified as a felony, and they they they, they uh, targeted crimes that they felt were uh, that, that were targeted African Americans, and th and this worked. So in 2018 in Florida, when you had activists like Desmond Mead and others who put on the ballot to uh, restore voting rights to over a million uh, former felons, mm -hmm. it got something like 66 percent of the vote. It was overwhelmingly right, supported. Well, the, the Republican-controlled state legislature then comes back, right, really? yes. and they amended, and they said you have to pay all you have to pay all your fines right. and, and fees and things like this to get your voting rights back. Right. Then Ron DeSantis, I mean DeSantis, <laughs> what he does, he commits, he, he creates mm -hmm. this Gestapo uh, voter law, voter arrest. fraud law enforcement. Yes. Uh, uh, a group of officers to then go arrest, arrest people, people who were sent their voter registrations in the card and in, in the in the mail and told that they can vote ex offenders. This is the, to to scare people and target and arrest the political power of African Americans in Florida. So this is this is a continuation of what we saw during Reconstruction. Okay, mm -hmm. so the, when you have a better understanding of this type of history, your your understanding of politics is directly related to your understanding of history. A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past and the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. So these are things that I teach in, in my online history class. I haven't, had, I haven't talked about it yet uh, today, but visit my website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. I teach two powerful 12-week online classes, one on Saturday, Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, that class just started up last week. It's a 12-week online course, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. It's a standard time. Register there. It's a discounted price for that. You can also call me 313-462-0003, 313-462-0003, or email me at ahnshow, S-H-O-W, at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow, S-H-O-W, at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, or you can email me through the website. Then on Sunday, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., I teach black resistance movements from mm -hmm. the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968, where we go through and look at this history chronologically and focus on this 168, 170-year period of history that brings us to where we are today to understand what happened, what led to the Civil War taking place, 1861, 1865, Understand the Reconstruction Era, 1865-1877, the Jim Crow Era, the rewriting of laws, rewriting of state constitutions, the uh, uh, Great Migration, 1915-1970, six million African Americans migrated from the South up north and out west, uh, and then it was totally changed this country. World War One, World War Two, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. To understand how we got to where we are today, to understand where we need to go from here. So visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. Everything is very visual, and the content is PG-13, so you can use this with your youth as well. I've been studying history 31 years. I'm a historian. I put together the curriculum for both of these classes and um, understand the transatlantic slave trade. I've been teaching that on and off since 2017. And um, uh, also email us because I'll respond to all emails. We'll get you registered today. Uh, A-H-N-Show, S-H-O-W, at the 
AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, A-H-N Show, S-H-O-W at the AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And when you go to my website, we have video clips, like previews of the class. You've never seen anything like this before. You, you, the, 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 the amount of history that we deal with, there's about 80 to 100 articles that we deal with in the first class. Uh, in, in, the, in the first class I teach, there's uh, seven books that we reference. We show you that you don't have to buy any of these books. We show you the excerpts that we're talking about uh, on the screen. And we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We go back 50,000 years ago. Deal with the African presence in the Americas going back 50,000 years ago. This will lead up to the... The trade, not oh, absolutely. You have to understand that you can't start in 1441, right. you got to deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors that yeah. lead to Christopher Columbus setting sail August 3rd, 1492, on the Nina Penta and the Santa Maria. You have to deal with December 6, 1492, when he, he comes across uh, the island of Hispaniola or what the uh, Taino call Quisaquea, which means mother of the earth. He called it La Isla Española, the Spanish island. We know the western third of it is going to be the uh, the the uh, a colony of Santo Domingo. The French take over uh, the colony of Santo Domingo in 1697 from the Spanish and call it uh, Saint Dominique. But those Africans, they are going to call it Aiti and have and, and, and they're going to have a slave revolt in 1791. And that 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 leads to the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. This is why we start the class in 1800, and we start with the Haitian Revolution and the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 because those two events are related. France sells 828,000 square miles of land for less than three cents an acre for a total of $15 million to the U.S. because Napoleon Bonaparte was getting his behind kicked by those Africans in, in Haiti or Haiti, and France was going almost bankrupt. So they sell this land to the U.S. so they could raise money to keep fighting the Haitians. This is how the U and this doubles the territory of the U.S. at the time, the it's, Louisiana Purchase of 1803. So my question is that is that why Haiti is being still punished? That they're being punished because they overthrew their oppressors. They didn't. They didn't de defeat just the France. They defeated the Spanish and the British as well, who Woo! were allies of the uh, uh, French. And one of the ways they did it is they reclaimed their African spirituality, which they call Vodun, which Europeans call Voodoo. Get out of here. Well, don't go anywhere. I didn't mean that. Don't. I didn't mean that. Stevie and I, along with Michael, will be back right here on 910 AM Super Radio Station.